Hello and welcome to Blues Talk. Today, a special Back to the 90s edition as we are joined by Birmingham City legend and of course Blues TV pundit Delia Adebola, myself and Dale, will be taking a trip over to the Costa del Sol to catch up with him and find out all of his thoughts about his time at Blues and more. The Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. Right, Dale, second Blues Talk of the close season. Mm. It's dragging. Uh, is it dragging? It's a bit weird, isn't it's it? It's dragging for you. I mean, to be honest. What, we're three, four weeks into it now? Yeah. It just feels and like a bit of a drag. What? I don't know what to do on a Saturday, mate. No. I'm not at a football stadium somewhere in Berkshire. Yeah. Or South Yorkshire. No, no, I need my little football fix. But you know, um, I mean, I know we've got the Women's World Cup coming up. But other than that, it, it, it seems like there's nothing on. I mean, has anything actually been happening in the world no that's the thing I mean for us you can do so much housekeeping at the club but then it's all about um, fixture announcements kit yeah. launches players don't come back until the latter part of June it's so, all just planning in, at the moment isn't it and yeah. we can't really talk about that for an hour on a no podcast. there's enough for us to keep us ticking over but yeah you do after a couple of weeks I think you know then just want to get the, the matches cracking again and look forward to seeing what the squad looks like out of the new season um, England, of course. Yeah, we do have England. As I said, yeah, Women's World Cup. Yeah, uh, look forward to seeing, of course, Lucy Staniforth represent us there. Chloe Arthur as well, playing for Scotland. Yeah, I don't know whether I should admit to uh, being a Scotland supporter, but I mean, it's out in the open now. But still, we've got your sins. We we've got representation at the World Cup. Of course, first yeah. game is England Scotland. So. Yeah, should be one to look forward to. But yeah, now's the time, boys. Get off your holidays, come back in, and let's start talking about football again. Be Main nice. to come on the podcast, to be honest. Mm. Come back, come to the stadium straight from the airport. Yeah, it's not twenty minutes from Birmingham Airport. Let's, here. Just, let's just see come straight here. Come see me and Dale. Yeah, and talk about the beast in they're, they're going to get from Sean Rush and Co. And it's horrible just watching. I'm out of breath it's thinking horrible about just it. Watching, but it isn't. It's a necessary evil. We saw mm. how good they were last last season. So um, yeah, all that's still to look forward to. But yeah, in short, we're missing our football yeah. fix. We've got nothing to talk about. But I think for this podcast, that is a perfect time to turn to the legends of this club. Yes. The people that we didn't really get a chance to speak to on the podcast during the normal season. They're on Blues TV every week. Of course, live audio commentary available to UK fans. International fans can watch every game. Uh, These players are a cornerstone, really, of Blues TV. These legendary players, people like Gary McSheffrey, David Cottrell's been on, Darren Purse. Brian Hughes before he got a job. Brian Hughes before he got a job and, you know. Selfishly took the Wrexham job. Unbelievable, isn't it? Disgusting behaviour. Taking the Wrexham job over doing Blues TV. Pathetic decision. Unbelievable. But fair play to him. But there's You're one right. man, Dale. One giant hole in our podcast schedule that is now being it's filled. It's a big hole. It's a six foot four monster hole. It's a scouse gap. Brutal looking hole. It is. The, the big one man. and only. I feel like we should burst into some kind of chant now. Ooh, Addy Bola. Ooh. The roost. <laughs> no, I don't think those pubs actually pay us to mention them on the podcast, so we won't we won't do that chant. But what the man, man. Dealey. Yeah, as we mentioned in this podcast and this chat to come, Dealey was part of the very earliest blue side that I can really remember, uh, which is great for me to eventually be able to have a good chat with him and mm. work alongside him as we do most weeks on Blues TV. So, but yeah, this was more about his playing days, his time at the club. Uh, going all the way back to when he was on Liverpool's books and he mentioned some star study players that he was part of both at, at Liverpool and Crew before he joined Blues. Uh, a little bit about the, ba- the bad injury that he suffered, mm-hmm. uh, how his career obviously took a turn since then. But what a real laid back, humble, nice guy. He's for the someone, most chilled man in the world, isn't he? You know, for someone who would, who's as big as he is and you know we've had some staff games and I've played against Dealey in the Dome at Wastills and he is a monster still. Wouldn't fancy it. I mean like, his lower body strength, you can't get the ball off him. Um, 
fires like tree trunks. He still tries to have a little run at you as well. Because I think, like it, as he as he explains, he wasn't a conventional target man. You'd look at Dele Debole, you'd think right out and out, Big focal point, front, yeah. find him. He was the one to actually run in behind, but when he's six foot four behind him as well, six foot three, whatever he might be, um, he was quite a weapon for Blues. So um, yeah, brilliant chat with Delia and uh, just a genuinely nice guy who I think's done well at the game, and I'm still really pleased that we've at least still managed to work with him at the club. The Blues Talk Podcast. Well, Daily, thanks for joining us for Blues Talk. This is our first outdoor podcast yeah. of the season, I think. Beautiful, sunny conditions. Yeah. I'm sure it's raining when this gets uploaded, but still, yeah. at the moment, it's nice and sunny yeah. and warm. Enjoying your summer, mate? Yeah, no, it's been good. There's lots to do, like um, youth football and stuff, but and uh, I'm missing the over 35s already. And you've done a run this morning? Yeah, I went for a little run. My daughter was late for school, missed the school bus for a um, bit of multitasking, drop her <laughs> off and go for a little bit of a job. See, the condition never stops, does it? No. Even in that situation, still going for it. Yeah. I respect that. You still have a, get time to have a kick around, though, with the former player stuff. You're just telling us odd tournaments here and there and Sunday League and that. You know, you haven't completely hung your boots up yet. No, no. I've, I've played in quite a few games and stuff. Um, it's on a daily basis. People will ask you to come and play charity <laughs> games and... Um, I'll have to admit, sometimes I'll just ignore requests. <laughs> but you know, over this, over the um, close season, I, I'll play in a, a ton of games. So yeah. I, I keep fit. Yeah, yeah, no, good. Um, I suppose you can start off with your playing days. I know you're now part of our Blues TV team, so we'll come on to that as well and how your punditry's going on. But let's talk about your career to start off with. So take us back to the very start of your playing days. So you grew up in Liverpool. Yeah, I grew up in Liverpool. Um, I, I had the honour of playing with some fantastic players. I don't know if anyone remembers Tony Grant and went on to play for had many great years at Everton <clears throat> and Robbie Fowler. We all played in the same Liverpool schoolboy side and um, I think we won the English Schools Cup and, and obviously dominated with, with such talent in there like, yeah, like yeah. myself in, in that squad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, from there we, we, I was picked up by crew. Um, Liverpool, I, I was offered terms by Liverpool Football Club and, and I turned it down because um, I think I suppose I was a little bit daunted by the, the perceived competition and stuff, you know, yeah. there's, there's so many good players going into Liverpool ranks and, and never make, make it as a footballer and I think my main focus was to be a player and if that meant starting down in the lower divisions just to become a pro and then play some first team football then I, I was prepared to do that mm. Do you think that looking back in hindsight that was the right decision you look at the career that you've had made it in and you played it all the way through the divisions are you happy that you made that decision when you did? Yeah definitely It's a big move to come away from Liverpool at the time as well No enough to, um, to, like, and actually I was living up in Crewe from the age of 16 and digs away yep. from family coming off home of a weekend and stuff but you know I, I never look back I've never regretted any second of it you can always say oh what if this what if that but what if I didn't become a player and, and if that was my over like my what I wanted to achieve and stuff I, I've more I've overachieved really so I think more players should do that you know you see a lot of you know the big clubs stockpiling young players now for fear of losing them do you think you, the onus needs to be on a young player to get out there and you know take charge of his own career go and play football I, I can't see how players become players if they don't get the experience of playing first team football my first experiences were at places like Bangor and um, Northwich Victoria, and you know, just playing against grown men, getting you know, battered uh, and bruised, getting yeah. battered at the age <laughs> of 16, 17 years old. And, and I'm not saying that everyone that's everyone's path, but like uh, it definitely made me grow up quick and realize just what was needed to, to become a, a professional. Mm. Mm. But those players, decent, you talk about the Fowlers of those, this world, could you see that they were going to be players when you were playing with them as kids? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Robbie Fowler, like he was legendary from the age of <laughs> eight, nine years old. So we used to, I played against him a couple of times at um, Sunday League level, and oh, everyone used to call him Robbie Ryder. Oh, Robbie Ryder's playing again. Robbie today. Ryder. Yeah, no, he used to score five, six goals a game. Yeah. So his um, his legend preceded him back then. You know, it was um, and and Tony Grant was a fantastic footballer as well like you know to watch him you, you couldn't get near him yeah. you look at some of the players nowadays and and the way that they manage the ball i think everyone's got that in the locker but back then even as a young kid you could see just his football in intelligence yeah <clears throat> were you always a monster for your age in terms of size yeah were you always the big bustling center forward yeah yeah i was um 
I don't think I was much smaller than what I am now <laughs> when I was about, about 12, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, it was my, my size, but uh, I, to my credit, I'd like to think I, um, there was a lot of big kids about, but not many big kids who could play mm. as well, so. Yeah. Absolutely. On to crew, I mean, obviously their reputation as bringing young players through, certainly during that time when you'd have been there as well was fantastic they were almost the trendsetters for the academy system and everything that was good about bringing young players through how was your time there um loved it absolutely amazing dario was tough you know um he used to talk to first team players as if they were 11 12 year olds yeah um but the the guy was so passionate about his football you'd see him at every different age group and giving them all equal time and um, the first team got the majority of his time but not by much mm. I remember him taking under 11 12 training sessions taking um, 13s to games a bit later on that day doing one-to-one sessions I can't remember how many one-to-one sessions I had with him and it wasn't just me mm. like he'd do that for for everyone anyone and everyone mm. that's amazing really mm. you, was there some players there who made it through with your crew yeah the, um, Robbie Savage Gareth Worley I don't remember some yeah. of these Ashley Westwood Bradford and stuff yeah um, um, Seth Johnson, yeah, yeah, Danny Murphy. The record is quite amazing when you yeah. consider. I know, with all due respect to Crew, they're, they're not a powerhouse of English football in terms of size of club and fan base. But when you look at that list of players, particularly in the nineties towards the early two thousands that they brought through, so, so many players come through that system. They must be doing something right there. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you look at if they managed to retain half of those yeah. players, they might have been playing top end Championship, Premier League, you yeah. know. But but Crew um, s- survived by by bringing through that, that talent and, and selling it on. Mm. And, and that, I think that's their philosophy to, to know. Did you enjoy your loan spells? Like you, you already mentioned your first taste of men's football was out on loan. That t- big, big learning curve, because some of our youngsters <clears throat> will be coming back from their loan spells this summer and they'll be better for it. Did you find the same experience? Yeah, no, I loved it. My, my first um, loan spell, like I said, was to Bangor City under Nig- Nigel Atkins. Right. And um, it's fantastic because you know, you get that experience. I must have scored about 12 or 13 goals in, in a couple, like I think it was a couple of months or something. And you get everyone, you walk into the dressing room and everyone's buzzing about you yeah, and whatever. Yeah. So you get that side of it. But also I think when I came back to crew, um, you know, reality sets in again. So you get the highs of going out and maybe being one of the better players in the dressing room while you're on loan, <clears throat> come back into it. And then all of a sudden you, you vibe for your first team spot, you go and play. Yeah, I don't know if anyone remembered Dean Dean Richards. Yeah, uh-huh. I had yeah, my yeah. debut against him. Yeah, kicked center the, off. Yeah, kicked the life out of me. Couldn't get <laughs> like just was all over me. Couldn't yeah. get near the ball. Just ran over the top of me. Just welcome to welcome to, back to the, to the um, <laughs> league. So then yeah. you, it's another level of, of player. Then you've got to raise your level again. Yeah. Mm. Before Blues came into you, did you have a particularly good <clears throat> season? What like Blues must have saw something in you in that final year when you were at Crew. Yeah, um, the season be- the, the season before when we got promoted, so we got promoted to the championship. Um, I I think I scored about nineteen goals or something, yeah. and I missed half the season. So it was literally about nineteen goals in yeah. twenty nine games or twenty eight games or something silly like that. Yeah, um, and then we got coming to the championship, and and I think I must have been close on ten goals before Christmas. So. Um, there was a, a couple of teams who'd already sort of. Um, I, I remember, I think it was Charlton Athletic. Um, who else was it? Charlton Wimbledon um, and West Ham. They all had a little look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah and actually made bids and stuff. Right. So uh, it was. Blues was. Uh, I, I came to Blues, had an interview, and signed before I went to speak to anyone else. Oh, really? <laughs> so what made it. What, why Blues? If you had those options, how come you went to. Um, a bit of a weird one and this is honestly God true Marcus Bignett um, I remember he was at crew as well and he said oh if you if you sign for Blues you'd be an absolute legend they'd love you so I had um, I don't know if they paid Marcus anything <laughs> but I had him in my ear at crew telling me how I'd love it at Blues and yeah. whatever and I don't know I just went there and, and got showed around the stadium and I didn't really want to go anywhere else it, it, I was there all day and I'd sort of I don't know if I'd been talked into it, I'd made this decision myself, but it, it felt like it was right and um, it, like, you know, it didn't feel as if I had any other 
choice. Like uh, obviously later on, oh, we've got to go for an interview. We've got to go and speak to so and so. We've got to go and speak to so and so. But um, we'd already done the deal. We'd done everything, and mm-hmm. I, I was ready to sign. Marcus wasn't wrong, was he? No, consultancy fees needed there <laughs> yeah. as well. I think. Well done, Marcus. <laughs> what were your first impressions? Though? I mean, sign for Blues, obviously impressed. You'd heard from Marcus beforehand, but what did you think of the club itself when you got in on the inside? Um, no, it's fantastic. I, it, there was it was undergoing a massive transition. So obviously Barry Fry, I, f- I don't know if it was the year or two years before, yeah. I brought in, there must have been about 40 7, players there. players. Yeah, <laughs> yeah something like <laughs> Revolving that. Revolving door. Uh, and um, <laughs> Trevor literally had his squad and there was a, another 20, 30 training on the other pitch next to it. So it was a little bit weird in that way, but some great guys. I mean, Paul Dillon was, was amongst the, the squad and Dave Barnett that were sort of on, on the way out and stuff. And I, you, you see... It's some great characters and some fantastic players sort of in and around the place the atmosphere would would have said I would have said was the, the biggest thing I enjoyed about um, my early days at, at Blues yeah did you move straight to this did you move straight to the city or did you they put you up in digs to start off with no I, I got a fl- oh actually I was in the hotel it's not the Metropole um, up towards it, the NEC somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Metropole there. Yeah, that, but it wasn't that one. It was one oh, round okay. the corner. I can't they remember. put you up to start with and then you y- moved. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then quite quickly I got a flat um, in Solihull Centre and then moved to Hillfield. And then quite a few uh, players you were telling us around the same area when you were living there. Yeah, and, and they all followed me over to Dick and Teeth. So um, <laughs> Dick and Teeth got thrown up and stuff. And Commission, and, I think. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, a million of us were sort of stationed around here. We had our own little club. Yeah. Uh, would you say you played your best football with Blues? Um, you can be honest if it wasn't. My best football? I, 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 yeah, well, crew, but that was obviously in a low, low division. But yeah, I'd say Blues because uh, it was Blues where I got my my career threatening injury. Yeah. You know, it was, um, um, and, and after that, I don't think I was ever quite the same, even though I, I've still done quite well. Mm. Well, after some good clubs and, and played some decent football, but um, pre that injury, Blues was um, where I was, oh, yeah, I'd say definitely at my yeah. best. You must have been playing some good football. <clears throat> well, I was reading earlier, you got an international call up from Northern Ireland, was it, at the time <laughs> yeah. while you were here? Yeah. What happened yeah. there? Um, they were looking for a striker. Um, I think they'd saw, seen I was available. How I'd, do you qualify, Daly? What side of the family? Um, no, I don't. Just because, like, I've got a Nigerian passport, the yeah. British. It's something to do oh, okay. with that. I could have played for any of the home nations. Oh, right. and, um, Northern Ireland, I was called up for. Obviously, Nigeria I was called up for. Didn't go. Wales under twenty ones, I was called up for. Um, <laughs> You're around. When I was, hey, what are you when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't give you a kiss. Didn't go up to any of them. <laughs> yeah. But um, again, international football, another decision, which you could say you could regret, but. I played till I was 38, and yeah, yeah. But if if I would have played international football, the danger was I would have um, maybe had to cut my career short, yeah. shorter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see a lot of players, don't you, t- just sack off their international stuff towards yeah. the latter years just mm-hmm. to preserve their their club yeah. football. Bodies. When I whenever I think about because you were part of, I don't know, if you were you're probably being too too young, Cal, but mm-hmm. you were part of like my childhood football team. Like when I was a blue supporter, you're probably the earliest memory of you and Chris Marsden and Skipper and Furlong and Unlove, that sort of generation was when I was growing up. But when I look back now at some of the videos, certainly in our archive, you played with some decent players up there, up top in particular. You know, you yeah. think of Furlong and AJ. Nicky Forster. Unlove Forster was a finisher. Yeah. yeah. There were some good strike partnerships that you had up there. Yeah, there, there, there was a ton of us. And, and you could see just how good they were because actually everyone in their own right has gone on and scored 20 goals plus afterwards. So yeah. Nicky Forster, you, you didn't even mention him. And, like he became a fantastic player for Reading, went on and done uh, achieved records for them, you know. And AJ obviously international, and Paul Fairlong was amazing. Like just a, a great guy and and yeah. um, just an all round player, goal scorer and like a, a friend, you know. So yeah, there's some fantastic players players there. Yeah. Did you? So you joined in '98, <clears throat> Blues. Yeah, '98. So you'd have been part of the playoff sides that didn't quite make it. Yeah, again, injury the problems for me. I, I think I, I think I only played in one of the semi-finals, yeah. um, and the others uh, hamstrings and yeah, it was just yeah. uh, you know tolls of this, the season. Still quite a young lad, and and I think it, just by the back end of the season, it, it just seemed to be a recurring thing that like I'd get injured um, quite near to the playoffs and and 
be play a bit play my bit part, but never really felt as if any of the playoffs I had a massive contribution. Yeah. When you look at that dressing room, you mentioned some of the quality in there, but they seem to be a great group of players. We, whenever we speak to mm-hmm. the players that were part of that late nineties surge with Trev and then into yeah. Steve Bruce's reign, they all seem to be the same sort of mould, a group of lads that dug in together and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were there some fun and games in that dressing room <clears throat> that you were part of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think a lot of people mentioned the likes of Michael Johnson and stuff, mm-hmm. um, but Skip with his dry wit, um, Nicky Eden, fantastic you know what absolutely amazing people I mean the late Gary Ablett yeah. like um, and Steve Bruce himself you know so um, big characters but all all up for a laugh yeah. Fairs Peter Unlove like, you know, <laughs> I could mention the whole I'll have to mention one more person my, my fellow scouser Brian Hughes <laughs> who my um, partner in crime was he terrorising Dickens Eve from <laughs> South Hill. how did they let you and Hughes into Dickens Eve you're still here <laughs> No, but yeah, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's met some fantastic people because I didn't, didn't know Brian before, but left with some good friends and, and, and good to see quite a few of them have gone on and doing quite well for themselves now as well, like managing and, yeah. and coaching and stuff. Not fancy it deals, throwing your hat in, doing a bit of management? I've always been really random. If the opportunity came about, like, I don't, I, I'd have a, I'd consider it, but I'm quite laid back with stuff, you know, the... Um, there's another side to, to managing. There's a ruthless side, which mm. uh, whether or not I'd have that, I, I don't know. You wouldn't know until you're involved with it. But I see you affect a lot of people, and think people think footballers have it easy, but you know it's it's not all that. And mm. to make those kind of decisions, the consequences you won't see it straight away, but they'll be felt for years on afterwards. Yeah. Really, so. Yeah. Never say never. Never say never. We did. A, there was a vacancy at AFC Sheldon at the end of the season. <laughs> but. Quite I'm in, few, I'm now, in. Get, me, get me involved. <laughs> yeah. Steve Bruce, though, you played with him and then played yeah. under him. Mm-hmm. What was that like, the change there? Because he went from being a teammate to a couple of years down the line being the gaffer. Was that a bit weird? Yeah, yeah, I, su- yeah I suppose it was. Like, um, we used to travel in. There was a little car school, me, Gary Ablett, Steve Bruce, um, John McCarthy. Do you yeah. remember John McCarthy? Yeah, yeah. So, knew them all really, really well. Got on fantastically well with them. When plays go the other side, there's got to be a change. It's yeah. inevitable and stuff. So you you still, as a player, you still see them as the same person. But after your first conversation, you, you quickly realise. So when he's come back in, he said hello t- to everyone again. But then he was Steve Bruce, yeah. typical. Yeah. Once it is way and then I told you what to do. So yeah, yeah. yeah it was um, strange in a way. But like I said, you, you, you know what to expect. Yeah. I always find that must be difficult, you know, to go from being... Brucey yeah. to gaffer. Yeah. At what point does he say to his players, "You can't call me Bruce anymore"? You know, like Vincent Company goes yeah. to be yeah. a player manager. Mm-hmm. Will he be known as Vincent Company, or does he have to be called Gaffer now? You know, I think that's quite. That's yeah, got to be one of the strange, biggest challenges: like is to distance yourself from who's been your mates in the dressing yeah, yeah. room and partners in crime to then be responsible for them and dictate what they've got to do every day. I think it just happens, doesn't it? Like Naturally. I think, yeah. So everyone else who doesn't know the new manager will be calling them Gaffer yeah. and treating them with a level of respect. As a player, if you knew Brucey and, and oh, Brucey while well, everyone else, I think you'd get a few <laughs> funny looks and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. the change just happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's talk about your injury. I know we've spoke yeah. about it privately on Blues well, in the run-up to games and stuff this season, but down a tilt and end, collides with the post. Yeah, Who think, was it against? Um, Grimsby, I think. Just a regular league game? Yeah, just league game. I, I, again, I've been out. Hamstring problems, I had quite a few hamstring problems um, around that time, coming after Christmas as well. And I think Trevor was in a rush to get me back into the side and I I don't think I was quite ready. Um, And I've come back, he was going to give me the last 10, 15 minutes and I can't remember who crossed it, just floated a nice little ball in between the post and I'm running in at 100 miles an hour. And... um, I've got a defender behind me, which I later found out was one of my good friends, um, <laughs> Danny Butterfield. Right. And he's he's obviously trying to get the other side of it, so he's giving me a bit of shoving there. And I'm not saying it's his fault at all or whatever, but um, I've maybe taken me off the ball for a second and under pressure and then just mistimed it, gone to volley it and caught the post with my knee. Um, and I remember lying on the floor and thinking, mm, am I injured or not? And then mm. as soon as I tried to stand up, I can use straight away. It was um, at the time 
didn't feel a lot, but um, like you, a massive part of of my career, of my life, really. It, it, it did change a lot for me. Yeah. Mm. So, what was the injury at <clears throat> itself when it was diagnosed? It was a posterior cruciate ligament tear, um, lateral ligament. Um, my kneecap was split in half, and there was basically it just mess. the knee just needed reconstruction. Re, reconstructing, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Long road to recovery after the back of that. Then how do you? Is that a few, how long was you out? Um, a year. Right. It took it took over a year before I was back playing and stuff. Um, it was first six months was going okay, and then um, everything seemed to be going to plan. I was running before, like. I had think the time. Before, yeah, I had the time and stuff, but then it was the twisting and turning again. Just lost all the muscle in, in my leg. I was feeling stuff in my knee. Multiple injections later, still wasn't solving the problem. Um, it just felt like thing after thing. And, yeah. and towards the back end of that year, I, st I still wasn't totally sure if I'd come back and, and make a full recovery, you know. So um, luckily I did, but. Like I think there was a lot of perseverance in there, and and just a, a bloody mindset about I, I am going to come back and play. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I mean, we had Michael Kifton mm -hmm. well on Blues talk last time out. He's obviously got a long road ahead of him. David Davis has had a long term injury. Yeah. Isaac Vassell over a year for his recovery as well. How much of it goes on between the years and the mental side to make sure that you do come back? How how big a challenge was that being isolated away from the group and having to deal with such a Severe yeah. injury. Well, when you're, <coughs> when you're, uh, ne never mind being injured, but when you're in the first team, it's like you, you're protected. Everything's, everything's going well. Everything's fantastic. Mm. You drop down and then you're out of the team, and you might be sub. And then there's another level of all. Oh, I don't feel quite involved and stuff. But when you're injured, you're completely isolated from the main group. Mm. So, in terms of mentally, you've got to be tough days upon days of coming in and using the treadmill and, and going for runs and stuff when you, you just want to be out there playing football. Yeah. It, it was almost torturous, you know. It's, uh, I feel, I feel I've feel i got a real empathy with, with plays when I see injured, even the short term. It can be um, quite a tough um, road back and stuff. And like, especially when you're out for minimum six months, a, a year, out for a year, then that's like, you know, it's um, you come back a different person. Mm. Yeah, frustrating that you couldn't do after the injury what you could do before. Yeah, massively. Um, I was as big as I was. I was one of the fastest yeah. in the squad. Like, and I came back. I definitely lost half a yard. Um, even though I've probably gained it again. If you look <laughs> at me over thirty cards. Um, yeah, I, like, I, and I had to change my game. So I used to rely on like you poor fairlongs. I was built to be a target man, but I used to run off the shoulder of, of Fares and be the one running the channels and mm. stuff. And all of a sudden, my game changed and me being the target man and just holding up the play and, and more trying to link the play. So um, that t that took a re-education, really, because mm. I, I didn't know how to play as a target man, if I'm if I'm being totally honest. Yeah. You just fall into it and, and develop it as you, as you go along. How much would a prime Dele Adebola be worth in today's market, mate? Six Big four, question, yeah. left foot like a wand, <laughs> beast mode. It's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. What are you worth? In what are you worth in today's market? Are you prime deals. I wouldn't like to say that's for someone. <laughs> that's for someone else's opinion, isn't it? <laughs> uh, still managed to get playing though straight afterwards. Mm. Loan spell to Oldham and then to Palace. Um. <clears throat> oh yeah, yeah. Oldham Athletic. I had a couple of months there. Wasn't right, but right. you know, again, just went out and played, and 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 it it didn't go well in terms of I, I can't remember scoring a goal. Yeah. I think I was about over ten games, but it went well in in terms of like I was back playing football, yeah. and it was I was able to develop my game again and and try and get back to to somewhere near where where it was. So I, I I've, I've got to thank Oldham for the people at Oldham for giving me that opportunity back mm. then. Um, and then the, the, the season come to an end. Um, I think I, I went to Portsmouth at first. So I went down to Portsmouth, went to, to speak to them. Um, Crystal Palace, um, Trevor was there. And, and actually, I was about, I, I was probably about half an hour away from going to sign up in Scotland. Um, right. Again, the contract negotiations with Palace, 
weren't going too well mm. and, and I think they came back off her. I mean looking back at it, it was probably worth it was, I was probably worth what they offered me mm. you know didn't know what, how much we were going to get was it going to yeah. keep breaking down was going to be injured all the time um, but it, I think a team I can't remember what team it was um, in Scotland offered me what I was in at, at Birmingham and stuff and I just thought you know what it's new life go and give it a go got a phone call like I said half an hour before I was about to set off and Trevor said listen come down we can have another conversation so I went down and yeah um, ended up staying there and had a, another fantastic year at Crystal Palace loved loved the time I had there as well mm. had Trevor have a big part to play in that the fact that you played underneath him and he had the faith to go and sign you again yeah I mean you know, I, I don't know what happened with negotiations and stuff or whatever it could have been um, maybe Trevor had a budget and and like just didn't want to spend it all on, on me mm. or the rest of it on me. It could have been the chairman putting pressure, saying, "Well, like you've got to you be realistic. You can't give him the, and so on and so forth." You you just don't know. But um, it it worked out in the end, and yeah, I ended up down there. Yeah, spent that's part of five years at Cov on the mm. back of Palace. Is that where you really <clears throat> settled again and started to find your form? Yeah. The, <sighs> I, I had one year at Palace and to be honest it, I hadn't fully recovered there, there was a lot of issues um, it turned out later on that I tore I had a, a, a double hernia which I'd had all season and didn't no one had picked it up so see um, <laughs> these soft football these days yeah. getting mesh put in and all that nonsense Poor. in big oh, deals what happened back in the day <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I can't believe how I've played for as long as I did and and I knew there was something wrong obviously but um, didn't know it was that and then it was I, I don't want to be too gruesome here but like I, I ended up tearing my stomach muscle right because it, obviously my stomach muscle was taking all the strain yeah and literally to the I, I was that far gone that I just couldn't play anymore yeah. so I, I'd r ran myself into the ground but that's another after effect of coming back from the injury you don't want to let anyone down course, you sort yeah. of oh, I'm always injured there's always this there's always a niggle mm. I've just got to keep going through it. and in the end it was sort of I was forced to stop again yeah um, on to Carver though yeah so you spent five years there did you feel settled there 160 odd appearances in the league y yeah um, Carver like fans still speak highly of yeah. yeah after that first year like I said because the injury th I've spoke about that was at Coventry that right. first year where right. the, 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 the stomach. double hernia and the yeah. stomach and stuff mm -hmm. As my first year. Um, after that, I went on loan to Bradford. Yeah. Um, so I'd come back from that, went on loan to Bradford, where probably I had the best relationship I've ever had with with a manager. Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's got to be up there with some of them. Colin Todd. Yeah. And and all he did was uh, like um, brought me in, put his arm around my shoulder, said, "I can't believe we've got you here. You're an amazing player." Just pump me up and nice. like and let me go and yeah. and like um me and Dean Windas I think we were I was there for till about Christmas and we were top of the table Dean Windas, Windas was leading goal scorer I'd scored a few goals as well um set up most of his um <laughs> and yeah doing really well and then I, I got that phone call from Coventry to say uh, oh can you come back oh. <laughs> and there's a part of you not want to go back yeah, happy? I, I, there was a lot of um, water under the bridge. A few managers had come and go. Mm. I'd, I'd felt as if I'd been treated very fairly. Um, I wanted to stay at Bradford because I was being treated how I thought I deserved to be. Um, and like, I'd almost made my mind up, but like, they were Coventry were adamant anyway. So I'd come back, see how it goes. So I did. And then I think that was really the start of my my career back at Coventry again I'd sort of had a couple of years got rid of the the blues yeah um, which I had from from my injury the, the injury years and stuff and I was back playing some some good football yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't say it was brilliant like like I said that injury would still still fill me knee from time to time but um like it, it was back to as good as, as I was going to get really goes to show that you talk about Colin Todd and how his approach to you is mm. how you've you probably got the best out of you as a player. How each manager or each player needs to be managed a particular way. There may be another player who needs to get a rocket every so often yeah. to bring the best out of it. But you were clearly a player who wanted to be loved, felt yeah. given that confidence, told how good he was, and that probably got the best out of you. Yeah, at the time, and and like it, it it's weird because 
the, the, there are different moments. There are players who, and, and I think I was one of them, you wouldn't have to say anything to me. I'd just go out, I'd play injured, I'd play, I'd run through brick walls. Mm. Like it wasn't, I'd never need anyone speaking to me. But after the couple of years I had through the injury and stuff and, and loss of form and, and not playing regularly enough and stuff, I think I was probably in a, in a delicate position, a really. Place. A difficult, yeah, difficult place. And, and he just made me feel wanted again, mm. like, which was, um, and I definitely needed that at that point because I, I was probably drifting a little bit. Mm. So. Do you get many rockets from any managers in your career? Does it stand out? Um, they won't absolutely give you a good dressing I've, down. I've probably, I've probably had some, but I can't remember many. No. Like, uh, I, I'd say my demeanour is I'm quite laid back, I'm quite relaxed. I, I give managers the, a lot more respect, a lot of respect. And, and I, I, I always felt that um, gave, that enabled managers to give me the same back and stuff. So mm. n never felt like anyone needed to, to tell me about it because part of my game was my wholehearted, I'd, I'd chase everything really. Mm. I, I'd go and literally come off fully drained from, from the pitch after giving more than 100%, 100%. so um, yeah the, I'm just don't, don't get me thinking I'm trying to think of when I've, <laughs> someone's yeah. had, a, had a right go at me but yeah. like yeah something I'll pop up later. considering the career you've had it's good to be able to sit there and say that the managers never had to dig you out but you must have been doing something right yeah, I'm sure they have but I'm sure they've been respectful in the way they've done it and stuff because I've seen I won't mention the names but I've seen some managers fly off the handle, <laughs> throw things, yeah. get people by the scruff of the shirt, yeah. um, even assault players. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really. it all happened. No, it all, happened especially yeah. during those late night, yeah. early nineties, late nineties. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a different world now, I think, compared to when you was you was playing. Yeah, I think the frustrations are still there. Uh, like, um, and, and those incidents probably won't happen as often, but they they still will go on. Yeah, yeah. still have flare ups. Um, I want to round off your career: Bristol City, Forest, Hull. Good times at any of those clubs? Just mm. fun memories. You still see it like, even during a match day for your Blues TV coverage. You're still bumping yeah. to staff members or players yeah. who are now as managers or on the backroom staff of teams that you'd have played with. And yeah, most most of the teams I've played for, I've gone back and, and mm. seen staff that I've played with: Dougie Friedman, Nottingham Forest, mm -hmm. um, um, McAllister, um, and the, and. Um, Rushy gives now. you loads from Hull. Yeah, from Rushy day. from Hull and stuff. Yeah, the, like the, the, a lot of players have gone on and been quite successful and gone on and, and managed and stuff. And it's fantastic to to see them all. And um, and I'm not the type of person to to just look over and be envious of them. I, I, like I, I think it's amazing and I go and tell them how how brilliant they are and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, it's um, it's always it's always good to see someone you've played with. Um, go on and do well for themselves mm. towards the latter end of your career did you have a plan um no it wasn't to be a coach <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't to, like it I, I didn't have any plan really I, I i set up um a business it was more to do with cars and stuff um, with a with a then friend of mine and it was literally to to just run that and and like you know be a little bit of an entrepreneur mm. but yeah that that was it really but i think the realities of football dawn on you when you finish yeah um, you've got to have an involvement in football what something that you've done probably since you were five six years old how can you extricate yourself from from that arena you know it's it's not impossible but you almost swimming against the tide so to not have football in some involvement in your life going forward is is difficult would be difficult mm. how do you look back on your career as a, a whole proud of what you've achieved oh definitely 100 percent. yeah uh, i'm really pleased um the people i've met the clubs i've played for uh the the friends outside of football i've made uh, mm. and and actually the the games and and what i've, I've achieved and stuff so mm. And I'd like to think my reputation leaving the game, you know, is is one of someone who worked really hard and and gave his all and stuff, you know. Mm. So, um, uh, like you know, uh, and putting that into context, there's obviously players who who left and bad influence in the dressing room yeah. and um, like didn't really try. Uh, I'd like to think none of those. Uh, well, I think none of those could be level at me. So.
I almost feel like you were a player who got who squeezed every drip of ability out that you could. You can't. You didn't leave any stone unturned when you were playing. It wasn't as if you could look back with any regrets and say, "I wish I'd have done this and that." Everything that you had, I feel like you'd have probably left out on the pitch. Yeah. And that's probably why when we walk, walk around St Andrews or even away, in front of the away support now, how how many fans stop to have a chat with your ideals? How's it going? Forest or fans at the studio yeah. window. Forest fans. Forest fans singing at him. Yeah. <laughs> singing, at him. Yeah. singing at him. Remember in the studio. Yeah. That must be quite a nice feeling to still have the supporters remember your playing days. Going back, I mean, the last time you was at Blues is over what nearly twenty years ago now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. So no, and and the fact that I played Championship football into to I was thirty seven, thirty eight. I mean, there's obviously lots of players who do it, but I think the vast majority will make it to thirty, thirty one before they start slipping down the divisions. Mm. So um, obviously, a lot, quite a few managers must have seen something that they wanted to. That they felt they could add to their squads, maybe young squads, a bit of experience, a good lad around the dressing room, whatever it was. Um, like you know, it's only to my benefit that that people saw that in me yeah, as well. Yeah, nice. Do you yeah. have a favourite goal? Because we still have them show reels, the Dele Adebola goals, the top fives that we used yeah. to put out. Man City one where he went on a. Is it Man City the dazzling run where you started to have a little? Yeah, the, he went on that like one. a Ryan Giggs esque yeah. run and finish. <laughs> yeah, for Blues it would probably that one or Tottenham away. Um, there's either that ones, but there was one for Coventry that um, in a cup game for Coventry as well um, that that a lot of Coventry fans say to me. So um, talk us through it. Oh, t- typical. Picked up the ball, brushed through a, a bunch <laughs> of players, <laughs> yes, slotted under the keep. Standard, <laughs> really. Yeah. You know, t- <laughs> average. <laughs> All my goal. goals are the same. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you've done some TV work with us. Yeah. Did yeah. you do any stuff for Blues before, before last season? Yeah, it was more in? for WM. Right. Yeah, so WM did a little bit radio wave for Coventry, Blues, um, for Hull. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. They was. got Hughie in as well, actually. They, yeah. they, they're good at pulling in former yeah. players. So, but it, it was odd bits and bobs. bobs. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a lot of stuff. And I think the last year for Blues being, I've been, been amazing. It's just been a massive education. Yeah. Like, I am quite softly spoken. Yeah. Like, um, don't tend to express my opinion. I d- 100% I've noticed um, in terms of me like um, being able to hold a conversation yeah. in front of like a lot easier a lot better yeah. um, I, coming from a playing background for any ex-players who were thinking of doing it and aren't sure just throw yourself in it yeah. like it doesn't you sure, know it, it's yeah, yeah it, it's been a massive um, thing uh, like you, you know I, I definitely one of the improvements you can come out and do a lot of things but not many things improve you as a, as a person and yeah. I think it definitely has done that really yeah no it's been good you've seen a lot of blues this, this season yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been I think you described it in the last podcast as a unique unique mm, season yeah. in, in terms of everything they've had to deal with it's been quite a, yeah. it's been quite a roller coaster that you've been part of and to witness yeah this season I, I think a, a lot of people it'll be lost on just what an achievement this one has. I haven't seen Blues over the last two, three, four seasons. Um, they've played some of their best football. Like, you know, I, I played with Gary Rowett, loved Gary Rowett as a person, fantastic manager. Um, he arguably did the best in terms of league position, mm. but all round package, if Blues, if um, Monk would have had the same sort of backing and, and conditions um, with this style of football and the way that he's handled things, like I, I, I do think that Blues would have got promoted this season. Yeah. Uh, a real camaraderie. The boys were all together, mm. um, and that's not just come from the the backroom staff at the ground. I think the whole club has changed. The way that the and the, all credit to yourselves. The way that you engage with the fans, mm. um, with the players, going out and the homeless stuff that, yeah, yeah. that that's been done this year. There's a there's been a change to the club that that people might not recognise straight away, but in the years to come, when you look back again, you, you'll see it, and it's um, it's good to see. Yeah. It's definitely something that needed to happen. Yeah. Um, looking ahead, then, I mean, we sit here at the very start <coughs> of a summer, really. You'd imagine the rumour mill will start to turn in the next few weeks mm. once the playoff final and the Champions League finished. But what do you want to see from the club going forward next year? Just Additions, one or two around the edges. Yeah, uh, and and I've been privy to a couple of conversations where it's going to be difficult in terms of bringing people in. Mm. Doesn't matter who we sell, mm. um, that's going to redress the balance really. So, 
Um, but on that note, we are in a better position and, and now we can go and, and bring in some more um, and just see where it takes us. Yeah. If it's half as good as, as last season, then we're going to be up there around the playoffs again. Like, it, you know, it really does depend on just getting that extra player who can... Uh, I mean, he, he, Monk will have, he'll have a list mm. and if he, the more players he can get from that list, the better position that Blues will, will be in and, stu- and stuff. But um, getting rid of that, the... Um, you know the the start of last season that was horrendous, and mm. and not having that to deal with again this season will be um, a massive yeah. boost, bring a massive boost to to the to looking forward. Yeah, it'd be interesting, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Looking forward to it. Yeah, be uh, different, like Dealey just said yeah. there to last season. It's the only one I've experienced so far, so uh, yeah, mm. a yeah, different situation. But I think positive, like you said, everyone's looking forward to it, which. It's still it's a realism. Good. I think it's still a realism about the club. Yeah, yeah, it does have a dose of that, doesn't it? But I think that's that's what you need really when you go into a summer. You look mm-hmm. at you look at you know the, you look at the four teams that are in the playoffs this year, mm-hmm. the sizes of the club, the backing they have, the financial clout. I mean, the championship now. The gaffer keeps mentioning it. It's got to be the most competitive in terms of who can beat who on any given day yeah. in world football. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, you look in like La Liga or whoever. You can pretty much nail down that Real Madrid or Barcelona will beat. Mm-hmm. 90% of the teams every week whereas in the championship yeah. I mean, well, how Norwich. often have we looked at scores this season and gone can you believe they've got a result against them <laughs> yeah. or that's yeah. unbelievable it's just quite a, it's an amazing division mm-hmm. so yeah. and then against all the top sides we've done we've more than held our yeah. own especially at home we've taken the game to a lot of very good sides consistency um, has been probably the, the major mm. falling point and, but with the squad the size it is like and the amount of effort the boys put into every game it was inevitable that they you can't maintain that for a whole season so um, yeah it's going to be interesting let's see where we end up hopefully in a year's time we'll be sitting here Dealey part 2 talking (laughs) promotion uh, party (laughs) yeah (laughs) wouldn't that be nice we'll see Dealey thank you for inviting us into your home no it's been a great chat to hear about big deals here in the sun as well always yeah. nice and you bought the weather so appreciate it mate thank you yeah you're always welcome bring a few beers next time <laughs> <laughs> the Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning D Lady Bowler ladies and gentlemen what a guy what a man you know I didn't have the heart to say you asked at one point there you're like oh, I don't know if you're too young to remember him playing for Blues mm. um, signed in February 98 I had just turned one the month yeah, before so uh, yeah far too young. young but I mean testament to the man's longevity I remember First season I had a season ticket here was the Houghton season, so 11 12. He, was still, he came here with Hull. I don't know if he was on the bench, but I know he was at least playing for Hull at that time. Yeah. So the man had a long career in the championship. Yeah, I think he takes, he takes pride in the fact that he suffered a bad injury, still managed to have the career he did playing in the championship mm-hmm. until his late 30s. As he mentioned, he's yeah, a huge testament to how he applied himself. And like we say, I think he's just a player who squeezed every drop of ability he had, no regrets, uh, great mentality, would always work. Never got a roasting off managers, which is interesting. You know, it must have been an easy one to manage. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't want to be the one to tell him off or anything, <laughs> would you? Or try and have like a word with him in the corner. <laughs> I know he's laid he, back, but... <laughs> sometimes he'll wander in late at Blues TV and it's it's absolutely fine, Dealey. <laughs> nice one, Dealey. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. <laughs> it, we were early. <laughs> um but yeah, yeah, no, like we like we said, great, and a, still a fan's favourite. I mean, you still walk around the ground, and um, he's the one that most fans will stop and want to yeah. picture with and have a chat with. And this is twenty years after he he joined the club. So spoke about the forest thing uh, just then with him. I remember that we just brought the studio back. All right, we didn't have it for a bit the season. Blues TV, all very boring, I know, but mm. brought it back. Forest at home. I just remember because I could see you and Dealey in the studio during the second half. All the Forest fans like knocking on the window and trying to take selfies with him. You can tell, even without audio, you can tell they're all singing his name. Yeah, yeah. He's there, just polite wave, like yeah, that's a it. member of the royal family. Yeah, yeah. It just Incredible. Ta- takes it all in his stride. Very laid back, but no, great to work with. And as he says, you know, I think he's enjoying doing his media work, and he's come on over the course of a season. The more you do it, I mean, we've stood pitch side for a couple of the the little links we've had to do. I think at first he was probably daunted by the fact that everyone's staring at him, yeah. the lights are on him, 
Um, but no, it's a um, great guy to work with and a great career. By the way, him. credit to him, Muck's in as well. He, the lights that are on him, he's carried. So he should. Over, yeah. So he should. Yeah, he's part oh, of the crew. Six foot two of him or three of him. Still loves blues as well, though, don't he? I mean, you heard how many times he said we in that interview. Even talking about this season, like, yeah, next season we need to do this. We That's need it. to do that. Yeah. I mean, he is blues, isn't he? Yeah, well, he was kind enough to invite us into his home. He's had it since he moved to the club a couple of years in, so uh, he's kept it this whole time, even when he moved on to Bristol, Nottingham. Hull, Hull, Palace, all treks yeah. from Solihull. Uh, always, this has been his base, and so for him to come back in, live here, and still mix with local people, and does a lot for different companies around the, the region as well. So, um, all round good guy, but great career. I mean, you look at, like I say, some of the players he played with in that blue side. Uh, AJ, fantastic, Forster, and Furlong, and Unlove, and Bruce Ablett. You know, the Rowie, there's some players in there that, you know, he was part of a really good team. And got that's a golden generation for me just because that was my childhood team. I remember the yellow and black pony kits that we used to have and auto windscreen shields. And it's kind of nice well, to a bit of nostalgia. Are available. <laughs> nice bit of nostalgia to look back upon when you talk to Dealey about those times because that was me going down as a kid before you see the game behind the curtain as you do now. So. Yeah, all in all, a top guy. But we'll look to do more of these throughout the summer, next That's few it, weeks. Yeah. I mean, the players will be in in a couple of weeks' time, but in amongst that, good to get some of the former players. Um, so we'll work hard to try and get them in as well. And as we've already plugged on the last episode of Blues Talk, we'll get a Steve said an interview in as well. Yes, He yeah, yeah, yeah. is back from his holidays. So we have that lined up. A few of the scholars signed their contracts as well yeah, last, last week. Last Friday. Yeah, so... Just little bits of housekeeping that's going on at the club at the minute. We're planning, obviously, Blues TV, uh, tweaking one or two things yes, as yeah, well. Yeah. Big announcements to follow. Yeah, full Alan Partridge, yeah, evolution, not revolution, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, looking so, forward to that next yeah, season. Yeah, yeah, so another season to look forward to for Blues TV. Some more ideas, pre-season planning, of course. Everyone always wants to know where we're going and what we're doing and fans following us. So Where are we going? Actually? Plans for what we're doing and where we're going. Uh, and of course pre-season here as well there's a few days of testing that we're going to go and follow the boys so um, yeah not too long to wait hang on in there and we'll, the players will be back before Just we know look now how many weeks we've got until the first championship game I was about to say here could be away wherever it is yeah Got what? Yeah, always a good. I mean the fixture announcement day is quite good just so you can start to plan out your year where you're going to be boxing day um, three weeks you know, the fixtures by the way no yeah. actually I'm wrong no, I'm right. Three weeks till fixtures. Yeah. Then at nine, not that I'm counting, until the start of the season. Oh, it still feels long, but if they get... Over two months. But yeah, but the, the, the pre-season friendlies will fill up some time yeah. and what we're working on and then hopefully sign-ins, incomings, outgoings, enough for us to chat about. So yeah, a bit of a, a summer housekeeping job this uh, episode, but good to chat to Dealey and uh, some nice uh, nostalgic thoughts that took us down memory lane. Well, we look forward to hearing more on memory lane down the future from various former Blues players. Of course, during the season as well, I'm sure we'll get a couple in to talk about their time at the club. But for the meantime, I've been Callum Denny. I've been Dan Moon. This has been Blues Talk.